Thank you for attending today's researcher talk. I'm Richard McCulley, the historian at the Center for Legislative Archives that sponsors this series. Today's talk closes out uh, a really superb series of presentations we've heard this year. We'll be hibernating in December, and then again in January, but storming back in February. Uh, hope not too snowy a storming back, but we will from then on have uh, a researcher talk each month in 2016. We are delighted to host Charles Stewart, the Kenan Shaheen Distinguished Professor of Political Science at MIT, where he has taught since 1985. He is a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and Charles is a longtime friend and supporter of the Center of Legislative Archives. When the center was created and the Congressional Research Room opened with a full run of printed serial set, the Congressional Record and its predecessors, publications, and the Senate and House journals. Probably no researcher spent more time working in that room than Charles. He was very busy at that time compiling membership of Senate and House committees for the multi-volume committees in the United States Congress, which is an absolutely indispensable source for congressional scholars. Back in this pre-digital age, this work had to be done the old-fashioned way, and it was all right there in that room. Charles regarded the Congressional Research Room as a marvel, uh, declaring at one point that it was one of his favorite places in the entire world. <laughs> now, a couple of years ago, when he heard he was working on this uh, book on Senate elections before the 17th Amendment, I tried to get him to speak about this work in progress. Charles very wisely, uh, uh, had me wait, and we <laughs> scheduled today's talk earlier this year. Princeton University Press um, uh, published this book earlier in the year, and it's already been nominated for at least one book award that I'm aware of. But in September and October, our plans to talk today about Senate elections uh, nearly got derailed due to all of the excitement and chaos in the selection of the new Speaker of the House. Two years ago, Charles and Jeff Jenkins published Fighting for the Speakership, the House and the Rise of Party Government, also published by Princeton University Press. Well, the publicity train for the uh, Senate talk had already left, and we discussed it a little more and decided that the issue of how the speaker is selected uh, is going to be around for a while, and there's really no rush. So Charles has graciously agreed to return next year and give a talk on that very timely topic. It will certainly be a not to be missed uh, researcher talk in 2016. So we should have time for Q&A. And uh, as always, if you have a question, please raise your hand so we can pass the microphone. Uh, Thank you, Charles, and uh, for this uh, much anticipated uh, talk. Oh, well, th thank you very much, Richard. It's very kind of you, a um, very kind introduction. And, uh, and um, so the word marvel was used. Um, so you've already trumped a little bit of my throat clearing, but it's a, it's a thrill to be um, giving a talk here today. Um, um, I was just thinking, coming over here, I arrived a little early, and I was reflecting on the fact that I wrote my dissertation in 1983 to 85. And I came to Brookings at the time to write it. I was writing about the history of the appropriations process and budget reform. Um, and that book ended up going from 1865 to 1921. Um, and um, I spent almost the entire two years here, if I wasn't up at um, Library of Congress, um, also doing a little bit of research. But basically, it was pretty much all done here. And I remember the days of taking the, the yellow line to the, um, to the archives stop. And in those days, you wouldn't even want to stand at the corner waiting for the light to turn. So I would just get out and hightail it straight across the street to get into the entrance and then come up to the um, third floor, fifth floor, one of the, to the big main reading room there in its probably pre, um, in its olden days, olden state. Um, so now, you know, the fact that I can come in and um, have a croissant <laughs> across the street and saunter across the way, and you know many of the local denizens are still around, but it's a much more um, diverse place and certainly a much <laughs> more interesting neighborhood than it used to be. Certainly safer is great, but also just um, having—I mean, 
you know, not too many political scientists do what I do and back 30 years ago, almost nobody did historical work, especially a quantitative historian like I did. And um, to be, actually to learn about the treasures, um, you know, the collected works of Charles South, um, some of you may remember, um, who was, who I worked with at, back at that time, um, was indispensable in teaching me about, you know, the evolution of the House of Representatives. And in the last 30 years, there's been a growth in the interest in congressional history. Um, and I've been part of that growth, but also, I know, I, I, without the folks there then and the folks there over, over the last several years, I don't think um, what I do in at least half of my um, academic time would have proceeded as it has. Now, so I'm going to jump into the talk. Um, I am a political scientist, and so there is a, you know, I mean, <laughs> Um, I mean, there are stereotypes about historians and, and, and political scientists, and um, I am tempted to jump into a rendition of the farmer and the cowman should be friends from Oklahoma, uh, which is one of my favorite moments in American cinema. Um, but um, I'll just say that um, the thing I appreciate about historians that I am not particularly good at is um, um, spinning a good tale. Um, um, although, um, as, as I'll mention, one of the reasons why this is a great project is because of the great tales that one can spin. I'm a political scientist and normally what we do, and I'll show you, is we take the richness of history and we, um, and we batten it and we beat it about the head and shoulders until it fits into a computer and we do graphs. Um, and I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you some of that. I'll give you a hint about some of the, you know, some of the really interesting um, uh, stories and, and, and episodes that, that go along with this project. But, but I am a political scientist now. I will um, stick to what I know. So there's the, the book title, or the book cover right here. By the way, I, I don't even realize, because I, I didn't, um, my, my co-author, Wendy Schiller, um, procured the rights for the cover, but I realize now that the cover actually comes from the Clifford Berryman collection of, of political cartoons. Um, from the from the National Archives, so um, it's coming back home. Um, and as you can see, uh, that's the, the that's the cover, by the way, for the for the Fighting the Speaker book, which has already been shilled um, <laughs> was before. So I won't say anything more about that. Um, um, so here's the just a table of contents I'm, um, of of the book, and it's it's too small to read. So I'll just note that. What Wendy and I do in the book is we, we look at um, Senate elections in state legislatures from 1871 to um, 1913, and I'll talk even more about that. Um, and um, we both have, you know, kind of the standard data collection, et cetera, but we also have a number of, of themes that, you know, that we, that we address that are reflected in the table of contents, such as the theme of candidate emer um, emergence, political dynamics of, of representation, and, um, and the effect of moving from indirect to direct election um, in the teens. Um, I'm not going to follow that logic um, of, of the book, um, in part because I thought that given this crowd, um, given the audience today, that it might be more useful and helpful to get into the project by talking about the larger issues, talk about some of the, the sources and kind of where material like this comes from, um, raise one of the enduring issues that I think comes from our, our research, which has to do with the role of political parties in the election of senators during this period, and then throw it open to discussion. Um, and I will, in the end, if we have time, um, that's the over, um, and I will, at the time, um, I will interpret the book cover. Um, which is kind of an interesting book cover um, and um, deserves some exegesis in, its, in itself. So, you know what, I think if it's okay with the, with the technical people, I'm going to stand a little bit and maybe um, just because um, cause of, the, of the setup here. So, um, I just want to say a couple of words about why I think this issue is important, this, this study is important, and why it's interesting. Um, it's important, and I don't think I have to convince you of this, but nonetheless, we got into it because of the importance of the Constitution, um, which is, you know, the enduring touchstone um, of the, um, you know, of American politics, but also, um, you know, political scientists, and I know historians and others have an interest, and actually the general public. This is one of the areas where the public and academics come together because we're very interested in what I, we ca I call the Founders Constitution. 
on the, you know, the, the document that was written and how it was anticipated and implemented in the earlier eight years, and then how that constitution then interacted with changes to American society over the next century. Most important, we'll come back to, we come back to this, will be the rise of political parties. Um, um, under Andrew Jackson, actually Martin Van Buren was the, was the guy there. He's one of my heroes, in quotes, um, in American political history. But then in the late 19th century, and I think this is important for the story we tell, the effects of the encounter of, this, uh, of the Founders Constitution with the rise of industrialization, large complex organizations, large parties, large business enterprises, et cetera. So, so there's a real, and I think there's an importance here that's both of, uh, in, um, to the public and to scholars and to the chattering classes. Um, <laughs> Um, of whom there are many in Washington, D.C. I think it's interesting for many reasons. The first two I've, I've noted here um, are more inside um, baseball sorts of things, but as we will get into, get into the talk, we'll see that the form of election in state legislatures is an interesting form of election that's common in American politics but not very well understood. By which th I mean is that the election to senators during the indirect election period happened in state legislatures. You had to get a majority of all the votes cast, but there was no natural method for narrowing down to just two candidates. Um, and so you could conceivably cycle for a long, long time to come up with a winner who got a majority. Um, you know, this is the same procedure that remains in the Electoral College um, provisions in the Constitution in case there's a tie or not a majority. So it's still actually in the Constitution, that sort of thing. But political, ah, um, political conventions. You know, if we go into next summer without a clear majority winner on the Republican side, this is the form of election that's going to follow. Um, so it's important, it's more common than we think, and we don't understand much, if anything, about the formal um, or the historical um, nature of, of, these, um, of these things. Um, so common but understudied. And there's a lot of cool stories. Um, and um, as I mentioned here, there's stabbings, militias, thugs, prosecutorial misconduct, and that's just in one election. Um, <laughs> the Kentucky election of um, 1897, um, which I hope I, I can say a few words about. But it's, sometimes it's kind of a snoozer, but sometimes it kind of gets everything that you could imagine, that late 19th century American politics, especially in places like Frankfort, Kentucky. You know, think about these states. This is happening in state capitals, and, and some of them are not in the middle of things. Okay. A little bit about, about previous scholarship. I won't dwell on this, but there's been a small amount of scholarship about Senate elections before um, direct election. George Haynes is probably the, the ur source of discussion about these elections. Um, he wrote two books. One was about um, the election of the senators in 1908 and then his larger book about the Senate in general. The two things I would just say about this is that this is kind of a typical progressive history in the sense that George Haynes really didn't like indirect election. And I won't say he cherry-picked, but um, as with a lot of, we were talking a little bit of, about ahead of time, there was a strong, like Woodrow Wilson, if you know, um, um, congressional um, government, which is, a, which is probably the best-known example of this genre, very strong idea about what government should look like, how it should proceed, um, an aversion to what was happening during this period. Um, but if you dig in deeply, not a lot of attention to the empirics of the situation. Right. So, I think a lot of times they were right, but we just don't know empirically, right? So, and that's George Haynes, but it, it, no, so there's, there's some evidence in there. There's a lot of argument. David Rothman's um, Politics and Power is probably the best known history of the Senate for this period. Um, and there, is, um, there are some accounts of elections um, in that book. It's a very good book, uh, written in 1966. Encourage you if you want to get a sense about um, the Senate during the Gilded Age, both inside and out. Um, and then Bill Riker on the political science side, this may not be known as much in, the, in this audience, but in 19, in, in, and Bill, Bill Riker is one of the founders of kind of modern political science um, and more formal views, but he was very interested in the Constitution. He wrote an article in, in 1955, it appeared in American Political Science Review, um, entitled The Senate and American Federalism. And the empirical part of that article is trying to trace out the path from the Senate being if we will, an agent of state governments to 
the latter part of the 19th then into the 20th century where senators had become really independent agents and how did that happen? And he traces out, for instance, the demise of, of, of um, instructing senators and those sorts of things. In that article, he makes a claim that I'll come back to in a bit, that by 1860, Senate elections were effectively popular elections. Okay? And, what he, and, and the way he, he makes this argument empirically is by taking the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Now, my students, I always like to ask them, so, Lincoln-Douglas debates, what, 1858? Oh, that's the right year. Um, 1858, they're running for Senate, right? Yeah, 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 they're running for Senate. Hmm. This is in the period of indirect election, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So why are they running for Senate? Oh. That's kind of an, an interesting, so, you know, so they were actually trying to drum up support for their political parties in a state legislative election that then would, you know, so if you believe in my principles, then vote for this guy, you know, big, tall, skinny guy. If you believe in my principles, vote for this guy at the end of the debate. And that's what that was about. Riker generalized that by suggesting that that was the typical Senate election. And um, spoiler alert, Bill Riker, as they say, is, was more interesting when he was wrong empirically than most political scientists when they were right. And he was really interesting here. Um, <laughs> let's, just, let's, just, let's, just say, let's, let's just say that. Okay. And then finally, there's some renewed interest in this whole business among conservative legal scholars right now because there's a, there's a new interest in, in you know, um, Ted Cruz favors uh, repealing the 17th Amendment, for instance. And, and there's, there's interest in that. Okay. Um, there is no extant data, really, except I note here that someone has begun to populate Wikipedia pages <laughs> um, about some of these elections. And um, I'll just skip over that because actually I think this shows yet again some of the problems with Wikipedia. <laughs> um, um, I mean, great effort, but there's, there's some fundamental problems in doing that. But I'll note there, there is some data beginning to appear. Um, the Tribune Almanac, which is a wonderful source. Um, I used to read it over dinner sometimes. I mean, it's, it's really great. Um, you know, from basically the 1860s until around, what, 1910 or so. Um, a lot of data. I'll show you some things you can find in the Tribune Almanac about um, the elections. Oh, here's, here's kind of what, what something would look like. So 1894 Tribune Almanac. Here's an account brief about the um, elections in Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, little one paragraph blurbs, but there was a multi-ballot race in Iowa, and they actually have a table here of the candidates and the number of votes that were received, okay? So that's kind of nice. Um, there's actually some data there that we actually started, kind of seeded our project with. There's also Appleton's Annual Cyclopedia, which is another wonderful source, although as an aside, it's primarily for what I'm interested in, kind of plagiarism of the local newspapers that are kind of cut and pasted and stuck in there. But nonetheless, as a, as a place to start. And so this is Appleton's about Delaware. Again, you can't read this, in 1895. One of the crazier, no, one of the crazier elections in Delaware in which the um, governor, who had been a state legislator, um, but had just been elected governor, there's basically a tie in the state legislature. So he tried to delay his inauguration as governor so that he could then vote for the senator, um, which caused all sorts of craziness and um, eventually no one was elected senator. Um, okay, so that's kind of the background intellectual and, and data empirical background of this issue of indirect election. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about how senators got elected under the period of, of indirect election. The core is, of course, the Constitution. Article 1 that set out um, that senators would be chosen by the legislatures um, and basically that the state legislatures could um, um, decide except Congress could step in and um, preempt state legislatures, which they ended up doing in the case of the Senate. There, was some, there, there were some problems with Senate elections before the Civil War. Um, questions about um, you know, proper electoral requirements, quorums, those sorts of things. Um, more important things came along in 1860 or so, and so they put this aside, but came back in the Act of July 12, 1866 to um, declare a way in which states would have to elect senators. And being from MIT, I will describe it as a flowchart. 
Okay. So there will be a state election to fix ideas. Let's imagine the November election. There's variation ar around that, but imagine the November election in an even numbered year. Okay. Um, the state legislature would convene usually the first Monday of the odd numbered years, oftentimes on, on um, New Year's Day. Okay. Um, but not always. So the state legislature convenes. Um, on the second Tuesday after convening, so usually two weeks later, the law required that there be a separate bicameral election for, um, for a senator if there were a vacancy upcoming. Okay. So by the way, the vacancy then would, would be filled starting with the March, what, March 3rd session okay, so during, during this period. Okay, so we're voting in January for a seat that's going to come open in March. Uh, the next day, the two um, chambers assemble in a joint session. They canvass the votes. Okay. Um, they see what the two chambers did in a formal sense. Of course, everybody knows what had happened. There's press all over the place. The question is, does the same person get a majority in each chamber? Okay. If so, got a senator. Good. Good for the nation, bad for, bad for me. Um, if no, and there's a lot, a lot of reasons, you might have somebody, two different people getting majorities, you might have nobody getting majorities, there's a lot of reasons, but if the answer is no, then you would immediately go to the joint assembly voting, everybody, Senate and House together voting, it's the same majority requirement, um, and you might get a majority winner, and if you do, you get a senator, but if you don't, then you just rinse and repeat, okay? With a, an important note here, is this the last day of the session? Okay, so the requirement is you vote at least once every day. Okay, and, um, but if it's, the last day, uh, so if it's the last day of the session, then you have a deadlock and no senator. Okay, and you forego having a senator for the next two years. Um, this happened 19 times, I believe, during the period that we're talking about. Delaware went without any Senate representation in the 1890s for a four-year period. Okay, so, and this is one of the issues that came up around the, um, around the 17th Amendment. Okay, so some data sources, just a few things um, where we get, so how do we learn about these elections? Okay, the main um, um, source of information are the state um, journals, and these are the various places that we went. Um, um, this tells you something about Wendy and me, the differences between us. Some of these places are, are actually just state archives. But so for instance, Wendy went to the University of Miami to get information about Florida rather than Tallahassee, which is where I would have gone. I went to Frankfort, Kentucky. She went to New York City. I went to Albany. So um, we tend to like to hang out in different sorts of places. Um, so some of these are state libraries. Some of these are big institutions. There are four that I will mention, three that are particularly valuable for state legislative um, um, sources. One is Library of Congress, uh, which has a big, nice big collection. The Yale Law Library has a tremendous co collection of state legislative materials that they've been trying to digitize, and that's actually how I found out about their collection. And then also the New York State um, Library has a wonderful collection. They were one of the first to put the catalog, at least online, which allowed me to look at things from afar. But the winner in all this is the Wisconsin Historical Society. Not only do I so, show the Wisconsin Historical Society, I show the most wonderful thing in the world to a researcher, an open stack. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's an open stack. And this tells you something about Wisconsin. At, upon, uh, upon admission, um, to the Union um, before the Civil War, they went back and collected state legislative documents up to admission, and that from that point forward, they continued to collect state legislative documents. So they have a full run of every state legislative journal from the founding of the country. It's tremendous, and it's open stack. They also have the proceed still, at least as of a couple years ago when I was here. It, but in addition, my favorite collection there um, is actually the Proceedings of the Wisconsin Cheese Board. Um, <laughs> which take up an entire range of, um, um, of, of, of there. So this is kind of what the, okay, so it has to have to have Viva Voce voting. Um, so this is um, from, you know, the journal, y'all, I assume many of y'all, if not everybody has seen a, a legislative journal. This is from the New York House of Representatives. Francis Kernan eventually was elected senator. That, this is the House, and here are the roll call votes, who voted for whom, here's the number, Kernan 
wins the majority in the state House of Representatives. Oh, by the way, don't, um, don't get freaked out. The, the markings here I wrote on the photocopy, not on the original. Uh, and, and the photocopy is, a, is cradled. It's not, not flat. Okay. Um, this is the Senate at the same time, same election. In this case, um, Edwin Morgan um, wins a majority in the Senate. Okay, so this is one of the ones where you have a joint meeting. It's proceeding on the next day about um, noting that there's no majority in the two chambers. Here's the votes then in the joint proceeding. Kernan wins in the joint ballot. He becomes speaker. Okay, so this is typically what we got. Had some other sources we used as well. State blue books, in this case New York red books. Lots of information. Um, newspapers had a lot of information about state politics, including election returns, and I mean, amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Um, and a lot of that actually then gets repeated in the Tribune Almanac. This is, like I said, this is where um, my fun, the, the fun stories go to die. Um, <laughs> um, what we ended up doing was creating a large database that records every roll call vote for every, every senator. Okay, so this is. You know, we'll have you know, information about the election in the chamber, whether this was a separate or a joint ballot, and which ballot number, who, who the candidate, you know, who, in this case, Francis um, Brewer um, voted for Roscoe Conkling in this election. And Brewer was from Chautauqua, um, Chautauqua um, District 1, was a Republican, actually ran um, um, electorally as an administration party, but that was a Republican. So we had that information about. Um, and we have 577,000 roll call records. Okay. Um, so 577,000 lines of this. Um, we, 752 actual elections um, where we got not only who voted for whom, but things like we figured out which party people belonged to, what district they came from, and just as much as we could. It's still in process, although the book's been, um, um, been published. There's a lot more that we've, I would like to do, I know Wendy would like to do, in actually building out the record of all of these elections. Um, and then we actually collected data about organizing roll call votes at the state level. That's not this talk. But we have some other things in which we're trying to characterize state legislative politics more generally during this period. Um, we've also, at least I've also begun to kind of create for my own use and maybe publication one day, at least online, a summary of all the elections, who the candidates were, how many, um, you know, how many ballots they got on various, ba various ballots. So this is Kentucky, um, a multi-ballot race. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what we're doing. So let me show you some big picture patterns. So back to the, um, so back to the um, flow chart of these 752 elections. Um, 510 went the boring way, um, and 231 went the fun way um, of some sort of joint ballot. 19 ended up being deadlocked during this period. Um, there are 11 elections that we've been unable to find out any information about. And when I mean that, you know, I spent time in places like Frankfort, Kentucky, going everywhere. And, and this means that there are some elections, I mean, and, and this kind of, I mean, like Wyoming has never published the journal of its legislative proceedings for its first legislature when it organized as a state. You know, so there, there, there is some actual um, fugitive material out there. Um, this shows you the distribution of the number of ballots when, when we ever we were get on the side of the, um, of the um, flow chart just how many ballots you would get if you got into the, into the joint balloting sign. And you can see kind of this big spike here. That's one ballot. And usually there, that's what you might imagine, split party control of the state legislature. So there's a different, major, different person wins in each legislature. It goes into the joint ballot. And then who, whichever party has a majority then wins. Okay, so that's the easy, that's the easy case. There's a few other cases, you know, two, three, four ballots where it takes a couple of days to work things out. Okay, so imagine Tuesday first vote, Wednesday second vote. So this is like Thursday and Friday of that first week. Okay. Sometimes the weekend, you go away for the weekend, you come back, you resolve a few over the weekend, someone will drop out, something like that. And then we have the, the fun ones <laughs> where, you know, the weekend didn't help. And now you're in this world in which you're just trying to figure out really an intractable, almost intractable impasse. 
Here's just a note. Um, I've, I've, I've just annotated the cases here. There's what, two, four, six, seven cases where there were more than 100 ballots. Um, and this is, when you get way out here, and these are the ones that people tell stories about to this day, but one, two, three, four, five of these end up being deadlocks. Okay. And one of these is, uh, actually two of these are, are, are Delaware. Um, and actually th this is the, the two-year deadlock in both 99 and 01 in Delaware. Um, but we did get two elections here, John Logan, um, where basically there ended up being a deal. Th there was another Senate, th th there was another opening and there was a deal between the two parties here. Um, and then John Palmer in um, Illinois as well. Um, so those are the only actual senators that came out here. But we, we could get out in that region and those are the, those are the ones where you get the stabbings and, and, and you know, bribery. Um, by the way, as an aside, it turns out, this is for the Senate, and you probably know about this work, but Gerald Gamm and Steve um, Smith have been writing about the history of Senate leadership, and they note that the, the creation of the Senate, of the steering committee, I believe it was the steering committee, arose because um, the Republican steering committee in, in, in a series of ele deadlocked elections in 1880 wanted to basically send delegations of senators out to state the state capitals to try to move some of these things along. Okay, so, so these, long, the, these elections not only were in the news, but actually Washington then would descend upon the state capitals to try to move them along. Um, okay. Um, th these, th the darker the state, the more joint um, ballots you got. And basically you got uh, the West, more or less, you got a lot of joint ballots, you know, a lot of fracturing of the parties in the West. Um, but also, you know, kind of, you know, the Appalachian region, um, kind of the Highland regions, where again, there's, there's fracturing of the parties. Um, um, so, you know, there's, there's kind of joint ballot elections. But in the West, um, you know, for some of these states, most of their Senate elections um, took a while to resolve. Okay, I'll skip over that. Um, this is where all the deadlocked elections were. And again, you can see by and large, they were in the west, in the mountain, mountain region, but there is also kind of this area here, um, kind of the Appalachian re region, and then Delaware sitting there as being the problem child. You never think about Delaware as being the problem child, but there it is. Um, okay, so um, I'll skip, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of talk about it. So we're trying kind of interested in understanding, well, when do these multi-ballot races come up? And, and kind of, you know, so we, you know, we, we do a whole bunch of regressions and, and, and the stuff that that Richard likes to jump over. Um, and um, I'll just kind of report that, um, you know, not surprisingly, um, you know, you're more likely to get a multi-ballot election whenever the party margins are close, right, the really close um, party margins. When there's a pivotal third party, right, not surprisingly. And so now it's, the election has become a three-body problem, which we know in physics is impossible to solve and in politics is oftentimes impossible to solve, okay. Um, Divided majority parties, and this is the other thing, is sometimes, you know, when the, when, the, when the majority party gets really, really large, then usually that means that there's a, fr right, then the party then can start to fracture pretty easily. Um, or in cases like the South, where oftentimes you would have different regional strength, right? And so um, if the majority party was fractured, you could also get um, a, lot of, uh, um, a lot of ballots. So let me just kind of tell you what the, what the takeaway is. And I'll talk about five more minutes and then we can take questions that people, people are interested. I could talk about this forever. Um, so this is kind of our takeaway. Um, when, we, when we kind of you know, drill down into the stories, we look at the big picture. Um, and one is that the rise of parties and nationalization of American politics in the 1820s killed the pure vir version of, of um, of the founder's constitution with Senate elections, by which I mean um, by the time we come on the scene in 1871, any notion that senators were agents of the state legislatures or agents of the state governments was gone. And they had become agents of the state parties, right? Which was true of everything. I mean, presidents by then had become agents of the state parties and. Now sometimes, we know from Rothman and other works, sometimes um, the, what, the, the senators were actually the, what, what, the parties were actually the agents of the senators. Sometimes it worked the other way, but the important thing was that it was the party that was important, 
Sometimes it was one faction or the other, but it was the party that was important, not the, not the state government. At the same time, and this is where we come back to what I, I said about Riker before, there was not effectively a popular election for senators. Um, Riker was wrong empirically. Okay? So parties were strong, and this last thing here, the senate elections were simultaneously partisan and insider affairs. So back to what the progressives were really didn't like. Because they didn't like parties, they didn't like the opacity of the process, and that's what we you know, um, encounter. Okay? Just a word about Illinois, Illinois, by the way, just to kind of keep hammering on, on Bill Riker a little bit. Um, it turns out, we, we actually have a little bit in the book where we look at specifically at Illinois. And between Lincoln Douglas and 1890, there's no other case in which the two parties nominate um, candidates ahead of time in their conventions. John Palmer in 1890 goes to the convention and asks to be nominated, but he views that as being part of his strategy to get elected. Um, so it's not really that the parties are doing the nomination thing, okay? Um, I'm going to jump over some things here just to kind of get to the end. Um, so, um, so the general process ended up being this. Rather than having kind of a popular election, so, so Riker's model, which, which persists in the mind of some people who have, who have thought about this before, was that the parties nominated Senate candidates, there was a state election, that would be, if the senator was up for election, it would, the state election would be a shadow election for, for senators. Um, and then whatever the outcome of the state legislative election would determine who the senator was. In fact, what we discover is that during the so-called popular canvas for election, there may be several people who want the nomination for senator, but there's no one person on, on each side of the aisle. There might be pretenders, there might be people trying, sort of like you know the, the primary season right now. There are many people who want the job. They go out on the hustings, they make, they make speeches, they try to make deals. But of course during this per per period as well, the norms of the country are such that you really don't want to appear to be too eager for the position either. So I think we have to remember that, right? Um, so then what would happen would be that during the two-week period between the, the um, legislature um, convening and the actual um, election of the senator, there would be a period of smoke-filled rooms. And if you look at all these um, newspapers, you will see you know, some reporter at the train station recording who is getting off the train right before the legislative session, which hotel they're going to, where the various camps have set up campaign headquarters in the various hotels in the state, um, state capitol. And for the next two weeks, there would be the quiet canvas in the smoke-filled rooms. Um, um, during which time there would, at the end of that, on the night before the election, on the formal election in the legislature, there would be a caucus, if everything had worked out, to resolve, either resolve differences or formalize a nomination. Okay, so really the candidates largely came from inside the caucuses. Okay? Um, and the actual results would depend on you know, particular particularities. You know, if the incumbent was run, running for re-election, usually, you know, there was no competition, and it was, a, it was basically a, um, um, you know, just a confirmation where the parties factionalized, things like that, would, would determine the details. Um, and sometimes there wouldn't be even caucuses if the parties couldn't decide. There are reasons, and I'll, I'll, I'll note one in just a second, why you might not want to have a caucus. Uh, we have in the book, and I won't go over this, but um, um, we, in the book we look very carefully at New York because we actually have very good data about New York and about where the candidates come from and what all the caucus proceedings were, et cetera. Um, um, we'll make, you know, by the book, I'll give you the, the PowerPoint deck, but basically what this shows is the various caucus nomination um, uh, majorities for different people who were nominated. So for instance, in 1881, just to show you what this means, Kernan, who was the, um, you know, um, was the incumbent, although his, now the Democrats are in the minority, he gets nominated by the Democrats by acclamation. He's the incumbent. He's going to lose what's to, what, you know, what's to be lost. Thomas Platt, um, the little boss, underneath Roscoe Conkling, the big boss, gets nominated in a fight among the various little bosses in New York. Okay, but he's, you know, and he wins 55 to 26 to 10 to 10 to 5. So there's a lot of other party bosses. He wins a bare majority. He then goes in to the election the next day, has all the Republicans behind him, and he wins because his party has a majority. Now, 
Um, it turns out that this was the year that uh, it, you know, Conkling and Platt get into this, um, since I'm being recorded, I won't, I won't, I won't use the um, barnyard, um, <laughs> um, get into the disagree, the tussle with the administration um, over the collectorship of the Port of New York, and they end up um, resigning in protest, assuming they're going to be reelected to the Senate, and they weren't. <laughs> and so this was a case where um, there ended up never being a Republican caucus to replace them, because there was such a division between the stalwarts and the whatever the other side, forget the other side, um, but the, the, the reformers and the, um, and, and, and the hardliners um, that they could never caucus. And so the, 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 the election was finally um, resolved. M McKinley gets, actually gets assassinated in the middle of this. Um, and the next day, things begin to resolve behind, behind <coughs> closed doors. So that's a case where you, know, you never got the caucus, but the Republicans won in this case. So, um, but by and large, in New York, we see it in other places, um, you know, things, especially on the majority party side, um, went as I said. So we really have two models of candidate convergence that come from our, our data. Um, this caucus is post-election mediator between factions, um, where like, um, this was Avarts, which I had mentioned previously. He's named by a vote of more than, this is about the caucus. Um, his nomination is made unanimous in, in a tame caucus out of which the Democrats could extract no fun. Okay, so Avarts had a majority wrapped up, he came in, he won, he was fine. So that's a lot of that. Um, but we actually have roll call votes in the caucus. Okay, the caucus was public. That's kind of cool. Sometimes there was the caucus as, as the temporizer, by which I mean the parties would fail to make a nomination in caucus. There would be a series of rolling minorities um, actually wasting a lot of votes. If you can't, if a party can't decide on a nominee, the worst thing that can happen is that you can box yourself into a position such that the minority party could actually beat a, a senator. So what would happen is that in a lot of these um, um, extended joint balloting um, um, sessions, the scattering vote would be incredible. Just everyone gets one vote because there ends up being the no chance that shenanigans could happen and the minority party could, could win some, um, beat somebody. So the, the platt Conkling case was one of those. Kentucky in 1876 was an example where they started off with five um, candidates, including John Stevenson, who was the, um, the incumbent on the Democratic side. By the way, error in the biographical director of the United States Senate, um, which says that Stevenson did not try for re-election, and in fact he did, um, because he was there right at the beginning. He dropped out eventually. Um, but eventually, what, so, so Kentucky is an, an example, I encourage you to buy the book and read it, where Kentucky had a rule, and I think a number of states had this, actually the Republican caucus in the House has this rule as well, that if you have a caucus to nominate someone for something like Senator or Speaker of the House, and there are multiple candidates, no one gets a majority, then you just keep balloting, the loser drops off, and then you ballot again, and no one has a majority, the, loser, the bottom person drops off, and you eventually get down to just two people and you get a majority engineered that way. Um, and nobody wanted to go into a caucus because no one wanted to, because no one knew who was going to win there. And so Kentucky, again, they kept scattering the vote. The caucus refused to meet. Um, and eventually enough people had dropped out, including Stevenson, that they spent like five hours skirmishing back and forth with just two people on the ballot and got someone and it was over with. Okay. So um, I will actually kind of end there. Um, except I will end uh, by just exegeting the, the cover. Okay, so this is 1911, um, and some people have asked me about the cover. And um, so the cat here, which goes onto the back, um, so Uncle Sam is looking down um, at, at, at the mess of, of the states. Here's Iowa. Iowa, um, it took 67 ballots um, to um, resolve Iowa in 1911. Colorado ended up deadlocking at 90 ballots, so they're the two bucks going at each other. Um, here's Montana, 79 ballots, um, two guys in, in probably, probably mining interests, right? Mining owners um, battling over, it. it's 79 ballots. Um, here's New York, two bears pulling, um, 63 ballots. This was the election in which um, Franklin Roosevelt, Senator Franklin Roosevelt, shows up as one of the major players on the reform side. So this is a reform Tammany bite, um, fight, and um, in, in part, and Roosevelt shows up. Um, in addition, oh, into the slide deck. 
Um, well, there you go. Um, <laughs> Um, in addition, during, in, in that election, there were seven other cases, um, oh no, um, 11 other cases where there was um, joint balloting that got resolved fairly quickly. So 1911 was particularly interesting from my perspective, and that's what gave us this. So um, I, I'll just end, and you know, we have like 12 minutes or so for questions and comments, but I, I guess the bottom line, a couple of, of, of takeaways here. Thing number one, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff here, and as I suggested earlier on, um, we got enough for a book um, and um, for some data sets, but there's a lot more that we would like to do both on the scholarly side and just, just getting the data out and actually getting the summaries and, and accounts of these, of these battles out. There are some, you know, there have been some theses written, et cetera, about some of these elections, but it would be nice to kind of have a source book or a site for all of this stuff. That's thing number one. Thing number two, and this reflects on the movement to repeal the 17th Amendment. Um, I think if you're interested in, in repealing the 17th Amendment, it would be instructive to understand the electoral process um, in the period that we're studying because I think in many ways the raw material of American politics now is very similar to the raw material of American politics then in the sense that parties are very strong um, and although there is, is an ideological, and oftentimes I think sincere ideological belief in the, in the power and the normative importance of states, at the end of the day, the parties are really the motive forces in these elections. Um, and so if, I guess the positive way, non-political way to weasel out of this is by saying if you're interested in giving more power to the states, it's not clear that putting elections of senators in the hands of state legislatures is the way to do that. Um, that would just, to me, give more power to state parties. Um, and as troubling as national parties may be, um, we need to consider state parties. So thank you. Please uh, hold your question until we can get the microphone to you so it can be picked up. At that time, did the Congress not sit until March? Yes, yes, yes. So, so Congress set. Yeah, so um, I forget the, uh, the amendment number, but it wasn't until the 1930s um, that the, the calendar changed um, to what it is now. Uh, especially with regard to your last point, I am wondering whether comparative research is being done on, say, the German system, mm -hmm. where the upper house is also a representative of the state, but there it is still a peer agent principle relationship because the person sitting in the upper house does not have an individual vote, but only a vote of the state that is actually instructed by the state, which is in fact the party ruling the state legislature. Right. I always love it when there's someone not from America, not, not <laughs> who kind of knows the non-American case that challenges me on this. So answer number one is no, there's not the research going on there. And two, you just told me why there should be that research. And I think that what I would guess is that there is probably a, an, a constant, I, I, I would wonder, the question I would have, um, and this actually does come from Riker, um, whether the instructed delegate aspect is a constitutional feature or is a norm in, in, in Germany. What, um, what um, Riker notes is that there had been a norm of instruction to senators earlier on, but it wasn't written into the Constitution. And then furthermore, as those of us who lecture on this to undergraduates all the time note, that at the end of the day, um, you know, the difference between the Constitution and the, um, um, and the Articles of Confederation made it very clear that senators ultimately were individual, or could be individual agents if they were to follow the, the constitutional letter. So I think that's probably the thing here is that it takes, we know from Riker, and I, this is something that is true, um, that by around 1840, um, senators had stopped listening to instructions and secondly had stopped resigning in principle. So some would resign in principle, right? And they stopped doing that, they stopped taking the instructions and they would just say, if we don't like it, get a majority. Like you and, you and which majority, um, right? And that, that was the only thing that could happen. Uh, I, have a, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> One of them uh, uh, actually follows from what you just said. 
uh, and that is the extent to which there really was a true principal-agent relationship after uh, 1840. I mean, in a classic principal-agent relationship, the principal can recall the agent at any time and for any reason. Um, and my second question is uh, about the source of the requirement of a majority vote in the state legislature and whether in a joint session each member of the state legislature, however many constituents that member had, had the same vote. Right. So um, with respect to the principal agent um, um, relationship, you're exactly right that um, you know, in, a, in a pure principal agent relation, the principal has some sort of sanction like recall or firing or something like that. And that's, you know, that is an important feature of the Constitution compared to, to the Articles, is that there is, you know, under the Articles there was recall. Um, under the Constitution there's not, and that, that's, a, that's a really important, important thing. Although, as I said, the norm seemed to suggest, at least not, if not recall, that senators did take very seriously what state legislatures said, um, oftentimes um, until around the 1840s, and would even take votes sometimes that were contrary to their own their own um, preferences. About the majority, the source of the majority vote in state legislatures, that ended up being um, a requirement in this law of 1866. And in fact, one of the reasons the law was felt necessary is that the states were beginning to um, kind of play fast and loose with um, quorum requirements and things like that. And, and there were also questions about whether you had to have a majority in both chambers or you know, what was the nature of the majority. And so the law also just clarified a number of things. Um, in terms of, of, of the voting weights, um, they were one legislator, one vote. And um, um, so it wasn't weighted by the size of your constituency. It also meant that, as we know, there was great um, variability in the ratio of the upper and the lower chamber together. And I've not done that calculation, um, but it was certainly really, really variable. Um, not surprisingly, by the way, um, when there was a bicameral difference, um, most of the time the winner in the House would end up winning in the bicameral. But it turns out that in about a quarter of the cases the winner in the Senate won. Because after all, the, 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 question, the important question was not how many votes you got in the two chambers, but what was the size of the, of the majority in the two chambers. And you can, you can kind of come up very easy with toy examples where you have actually a bigger majority in the Senate than in the House, although the Senate is the smaller body. And that happened about a quarter of the time. Yeah. Yes? Hi, I have a, a question and a comment. Um, about the 19 deadlocks that you mentioned, what was mm -hmm. the time frame on that? Was that just up until the 17th Amendment? or? Yeah. Yes. Just all the way until then, okay. Yeah. And then um, the comment was just about your cartoon on your cover. Yes. Uh, Richard may have mentioned to you that there's going to be a museum exhibit here at the National Archives next year about constitutional amendments, uh -huh. and that cartoon on your cover from Berryman will be in the exhibit. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I'm glad to know I was on the, on, on the cutting edge of, 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 of <laughs> constitutional cartooning. Um, but uh, by the way, on the, on, on, on another thing about, about the deadlocks, um, they came, they came pretty much up into the ratification of, uh, of the amendment and um, it's pretty clear that the deadlocks were one of the things that was really objectionable to a lot of, to a lot of people. Um, um, not just kind of the, the protracted balloting was kind of what politics was, but once start, states started losing, um, um, losing representation. I should also mention, this is one of the areas in which this majorities in the Senate actually um, took a self-denying um, position. The um, precedent was set very early, and maybe even before the Civil War, that if a state was in deadlock, um, and so there was a vacancy because of deadlock, the Senate would not seat someone appointed by the governor. Okay? Even in those cases where the governor was of the same party as the majority in the Senate. And we know from the work of my, well, my uh, other collaborator, Jeff Jenkins, and others, that during this period, almost every disputed election case was decided in favor of the party that had the majority in the chamber. But this was an, this was an exception. So the Senate did push back to the states and said, you know, your state legislature has to, um, has to elect people, and you can't rely on the governor to be the tiebreaker. Um. Yes? I was just curious um, what, 
what guided your decision to um, select 1871 as, as your as starting, starting point? Um, yeah, so why 1871? And, and thanks for asking that because that, that is something that I wanted to mention at the beginning. Um, I mean, part of it, um, so one answer, um, in some way the coward's answer, but, but one answer is that having the, having the election of, eight, uh, having the, the law of 1866 is very helpful because now we have a more or less stereotyped um, process and now we can just start slotting things in. Um, but once we got into, once we got into the project, I began to realize it would have been really nice, in fact one day I might do it, to go back to the preceding elections because it was, it was those preceding elections going back at least into the 1850s, say, that then gave rise to this idea that the Senate needed to really regulate the elections more thoroughly. And, you know, I was, rad I mean, I was, I was giving a hard time to, to the progressive historians and it may very well be that the historical accounts about the 1850s as well are kind of fact challenged. And so I, I would probably like to do that. The other thing, which is also really the coward's way out, um, and again, many of y'all know, know this um, if you've know, been doing, if you do original source work in this area, that there's a real sea change during the 1860s in terms of, of record retention and just um, printing rather than handwriting and, and, and also reporting in a timely way what's happening. The addition of things like, I think the telegraph and its spread also helps to convey a lot of information quickly. They think it's retained. So it, you can really tell that in the 1860s things get really, really much better so that by around 1870, almost everywhere, you can pretty much get a full record of every election. Whereas my sense just informally is even in the 1860s, leaving aside the problems of rebellion, um, that even in the mid-1860s, it, it, would, it would be difficult in many places to get, to get a full record of a Senate election. I should finally mention, though, that it's not like it's a nice, clean break. One of the unfortunate practical things in this, in this project is that the state of Alabama, so the very first election in Alabama involved um, two competing state legislatures, what were known as the, um, as this, this, the Capitol Legislature and the Courthouse Legislature. And basically the Courthouse Legislature, the Republican members decamped to the federal courthouse and the Democrats stayed in the state legislature and they both elected senators. Um, and the journals are not all that good. Um, it's not always clear which journal you're reading. And since Alabama is alphabetically number one, and this is the election of 1870, so the very first election in our series, I had to learn if when I was just kind of going through and cleaning things up, I just had to learn, learn to not start with Alabama. Because <laughs> I still have not figured out Alabama 1870. Um, the very first one, in, you know, the very first one that would appear in any compilation. It's, it's, a, it's a mess, royal mess. I would, I would just add that I thought what was most interesting and informative about your book is your examination of the motivations and justifications of the reform movement to move from indirect to direct elections, mm -hmm. how it was going to take the power of money and corrupt individuals <laughs> and party politics out of the system, mm -hmm. and the sense of irony that it comes back in even stronger form. So yeah. sort of the unintended consequences of reform. Um, yeah, well, as you, well, those of us who study money in politics, um, money will find, <laughs> finds its way. Um, all money ru runs downhill and um, it'll, it'll find its way. And no, exactly. And, um, you know, and I should also just say very quickly, I know, I know, I know we're out of time, um, but, um, you know, political scientists have tried really hard to find the, the effects of going to direct election. And it's actually really hard to find policy or other effects of direct election. It looks like politics continues more or less um, as, 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 as before. With one exception, again, read the book, that um, Rose Franklin Roosevelt probably would not have had a Democratic Senate when he became president if there had still been indirect election. Um, and um, the Do Nothing 80th Congress would have probably been preceded by the Do Nothing 79th Congress. So there are consequences, there are times when there would have been Democratic or Republican Senates um, that we don't have now. 
Um, but otherwise, it's kind of turtles all the way down. Well, Charles, on that uh, very uh, upbeat <laughs> <Uplifting> note, <laughs> we'll conclude the discussion. And uh, this has been a terrific talk. Uh, much to think about when uh, we hear the idea of repealing the 17th Amendment thrown around. And um, we thank you for the incredible work of research that went into this. It's just mind-boggling to think what you guys have accomplished. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming.